right, hello and welcome. Uh, I am uh, really very, very happy um, to be talking from Gotham Sound, and uh, we are live with David Patterson. Um, David, I'm going to have you uh, on screen in a second. Hey, David. Um, hey. So, you know, we're um, David Patterson. I guess the first thing that we should do is if you can introduce yourself. Uh, I know you as a sound editor and a re-recording mixer, but um, you know, tell tell us the kind of stuff you've worked on and and um, the kind of stuff that you're doing. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I've been doing this for a long time, uh, about thirty years now. Uh, and yes, I'm supervising sound editor, re-recording mixer. Uh, you know, I've worked in almost every editing capacity in the you know dialogue, effects, foley. BG, sound design, music, you know, I've done all that. Um, I originally started my uh, way, way, way back when, you know, more focused on music. Uh, and then that led me into the sound editing field. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, kind of a jack of all trades, I think I would call myself to a large extent. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, and I've taught at NYU, uh, the same as yourself, uh, in the uh -huh. graduate program. Uh -huh. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, that's, you know, and the, you know, I've done as far as types of projects, you know, I'm mostly do feature films. Uh, I do some TV, uh, I've done a handful of commercials. I've done a few PR projects just to, to get a shot. Um, uh, so, you know, pretty much all over and from low budget stuff to big, large studio pictures, you know, you name it. So. Uh, very cool. Um, we, we have actually worked together where I was a production sound mixer and um, you were the supervising sound editor when you were at Spin Cycle. Did we really? Uh, yeah. Uh, did you work for that? <laughs> Um, I, you know, I don't know. I know Steven Altabella was there for a while and, um, did, did, um, did you work on Palookaville? Was that one of the ones? Oh, all right. But anyways, we'll, we'll play the IMDB game. Yeah. Um, but you know, the thing that, well, there's a couple of things I really, um, uh, I, I'm really, I'm always excited to talk to you. Um, but one of the things that have come up over and over again in the last, I would say, um, intensely in the last year that I can remember is um, this idea, if, if we can ever imagine making movies in the traditional way, um, the importance of isolated tracks versus production sound mix on set that the production sound mixer makes. And I, I wondered, it would be really helpful for me to understand um, if you can walk me through the process of what happens, I work on a show, um, I, you know, I make a mix, I hand in my tracks, um, you know, the DIT copies them. Uh, what happens? Uh, and I'll show you, I've got my Pro Tools rig set up so I can show you this. Um, there's a time delay between when um, the sound gets to the boom versus when it gets to the lob. You know, it, you know, depending on how close the boom is to the actor, you know, the, the sound's going to get to the lob first. It takes a little bit longer for it to get to the boom. Uh, so when you mix those two tracks together, um, you're going to get a little bit of phasing. Uh, once we have it in Pro Tools, we can adjust that time delay and get them in exactly perfect phase so that, um, that we can mix those tracks together and not get any phasing. Um, so 
so because of that, we just only use the ISO tracks. I mean, there's, there's a lot of other reasons why we just only use the ISO tracks, but that's the big one. There is no overcoming that in the live uh, application, you know. So, so for for post, it's the ISO tracks are the only thing that we care about, and the only time that we ever use the mix track. Every once in a while, you'll get a recording where for some reason something got recorded into the mix track and did not get recorded into the ISO. Uh, and when those, I mean, it, it's, I'll be honest, it's, I found it's happened to me maybe like three or four times in the last five years. It doesn't happen very often that that happens, but those are the only times we'll use the mix track because we have no choice. That's the only place where the material is. But beyond that, we, we just don't use the mix track. But they, again, the picture department, they depend on it. You know, they, they need it desperately. So, so, um, I guess. My question is, what kind of communication helps you the most um, from when that the production sound mixer can give you? Well, I mean, I, the funny thing is, despite the fact that you know we work together so closely in a sense with the production sound mixer, by the time I come on the job, this production sound mixer is long gone. <laughs> you know. <laughs> In a perfect world, the communication would be that they'd hire me earlier so I could still talk to the production sound mixer. Uh, and I've had that happen on occasional like TV shows where I do season two or season three. It's great. I get to get a, uh, uh, you know, um, a communication going. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the main thing is is just about, you know, places where, um, uh, you know, where there were problems um, that, uh, you know, you know, just a little bit of information about, you know, what the problems are, you know, like, for instance, you know, give and take has an HMI buzz, for instance, maybe, you know, maybe I uh, take three of a, of a particular shot. There was a bad, uh, there was a bad buzz that started, but the production recordist knows that on take two, uh, it was good. You know, giving us that information in the sound reports, because, you know, once if they pick the, the take with the buzz, which is always the one that has the best performance. Right. That's, you know, <laughs> that's the one that they always choose. Uh, it, it's great for us to if, just looking at the sound reports, say, oh, hey, I could look at this take for an alt. Otherwise, we have to play through all the takes of all the you know shots for the scene looking for good alts, you know, so. Little bits of information like that is is always super useful, which I don't very often get in sound reports actually. So, so I, you know, I think the biggest um, struggle that I can remember having as a production sound mixer working when there's no post sound person in place is, um, who do I go to when there's a sound issue and I want somebody to check it out? How how um, how could we make that communication better? Well, I mean, again, I mean, it's tricky because a lot of times we're just not hired. Um, I, I will say there's been a lot of jobs where stuff like that has happened. Uh, you know, that's the the sound uh, mixer is concerned about stuff, and they just get in touch with the picture department. And I've had a number of jobs where picture assistants or picture editors who are friends of mine just give me a call and they say, "Can you check this stuff out?" And I'm not necessarily on the job. A lot of those projects, I don't end up even doing the job, but I check the stuff out anyway and say, you know, oh, yeah, we can solve that. That's not a problem. This is all we'd have to do. And this, you know, um, uh, you know, with Isotope or various other plugins, I could get that out. Or I say, oh, that's going to be a problem, you know, and, and, you know, but yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing because a lot of times once you're in production, they, they haven't even decided who's doing the sound yet on, on films anyway. On TV shows, they usually have hired the sound team uh, when you're in production. So it's a bit, there's more of a back and forth thing. Got it. Um, so I understand that you, um, here, I'm just going to move my microphone a little closer. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. I understand that uh, you uh, brought some, some Pro Tools sessions to share. Yeah, um, well, I just have a, some stuff I checked into one session, actually. Do you, do you have the screen up there that people can see? Uh, we do now. Okay. The, what I want to say, you know, right here what I've got is, uh, you know, I just found some stuff from some old jobs. I can't use anything that's current because 
I can't, <laughs> you know? so, uh, but I found some stuff from some old jobs and I just wanted to zoom in and show you here. Like what we're looking here is this is the mix track and this is uh, the boom track. And then these are the love tracks. And if you zoom way, way in, you can see the time difference here uh, between when the sound gets to the boom versus when it gets to the love. It's not a lot of, of time difference, but, it, you know, like if I zoom way, way in here, you can see if I just change this from time code to uh, minutes and seconds, it's, a, it's only a millisecond difference right now. Uh, and samples, it's, it's 90 samples. So it's regular, relatively negligible. But if I play these two tracks together... Um, oh, sorry. TV crews are there. We gotta go, man. There's, there's a little bit of phasing with them. And there's a particular plugin that we use uh, in post called Auto Align Post. Um, and what I can do is I can tell it to feed this reference. And let's see, let's let me zoom in and find a spot again where we can clearly see, you know, so we can clearly see that there's a phase difference here. So I'm going to zoom back out uh and just run this plugin on that and when i zoom back into that same spot uh um what you'll see is that now they're a dead phase accurate so if i play that line again with this is the boom and the love together oh sorry tv crews are there we gotta go man no phasing and i'm gonna undo that so you can hear it with the phasing again oh sorry TV crews are there. We gotta go, man. I mean, the phasing is relatively subtle. I'm not sure how well you're gonna hear it over Skype. Um, but, you know, this is one of the, the reasons, you know, one of the big reasons why we want to use the ISO tracks instead of the, the mix, because that phasing is going to be built into the mix track. There's nothing that can be done about it. You know, there's, you can't, you just can't change the, uh, the sync. And even if you could, um, it changes constantly as the actor moves closer to the boom or farther away that that time difference changes you know this plugin kind of updates it um you know you can switch between static or dynamic but in dynamic mode it's actually recalculating the distance between the boom and the lav in real time and adjusting the sound to keep them dead on phase um so you know it's you know and then and then the other the other reason is like if if we take a listen here to the the boom oh sorry tv crews are there we gotta go man it's uh it's noisy but it's a nice sounding microphone if i listen to a lot oh sorry tv crews are there we gotta go man it's uh it, it's brighter uh which is nice but it's a little bit harsh you know and you know the nice thing is that that i can also come in here and I can use a program uh, called Isotope, um, and I can just send this over here. And we can, um, in Isotope, I can um, uh, denoise it uh, quite a bit, you know, separately from the lav. Um, I'm just gonna just do a couple things, just very. Oh, sorry. TV crews are there. Just not you know, not doing a very detailed job, but just doing a little rough. Oh, sorry. TV crews are there. We gotta go, man. So right off the bat, I can set this back to Pro Tools and you can see if we look, I'm gonna zoom in. This was the track before I sent it to Isotope. This is after it comes back. You know, the noise has dropped considerably. Then I can mix that with the love again. Oh, sorry. TV crews are Oh, you know what? Let me, I'm going to take this this track out here that is basically just noise. Oh, sorry. TV crews are there. We got to go, man. And then I can... I, TV crews are there. We got to go, man. I can I can mix it by sort of just saying, you know, this one has the sort of warmth and the naturalness. This one has the... Uh, TV crews are there. We gotta go. That kind of brightness, but a little bit, you know... Lavi, <laughs> you know, kind of sounding. And before I've done any EQ, I can kind of get a balance. But TV crews are there. Too much. TV crews. Oh, you know what? I don't think. Yes, I got a. I, this is before I have aligned this. Let me align this. And once. I oh, 
Sorry. TV crews are there. We gotta go, man. You know, it's a, it's already, it just sounds much more natural and I, I have less noise, you know, and, you know, and, uh, and then I have the ability, maybe. TV crews are there. We gotta go. Tend that there, for some reason, there was a little bit of a mic hit in the middle of this, you know, so I might need to just switch. TV crews are there. You know, to that for, for a moment. And then maybe over here, you know, we get to pick up a bunch of noise and the boom, you know, having the ability to kind of go back and forth between the boom and the lav constantly, uh, you know, is is really, you know, key to sort of, you know, what we're doing while we're working with this stuff. So, you know, that's just a brief example of, of you know, how we would use how we would use those separately and why it's so important to have that as opposed to the mix track for us. Well, so yes and no. I mean, there's two separate phases. In the editing phase, you're really just thinking about um, having all options available or as many good options as possible available uh, for the mix. You know, doing that sort of the placement and, 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 and the perspective um, you don't want to make that decision when you're doing this, the dialogue editing, because, um, then you're tied into it. And at the mix stage, somebody might be like, yeah, I know we're in a wide shot, but I still want it to feel close and intimate here, you know? And if, if that decision's already made, you can't, you can't change that. So, um, so during the, the editing phase where we're going through this stuff and kind of cleaning it up and aligning it, it's sort of in prep for the mix. So we're giving the options, you know, from the boom to sort of definitely be able to use the boom to kind of have a, a wider kind of sense and a more natural perspective and have the love to be able to mix that in or or lead with it even if you want the stuff to sort of be more in your face and more intimate, you know. But that gets made at the at the final mix because you 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 know you there's always a lot of people involved and everyone's going to have a different impression or opinion about, you know, how the material should sound. <sighs> That's a really good question. I mean, obviously the, the biggest thing, um, well, there's a there's a number of really big things. One thing is, um, just if say you're a production sound mixer that's got a lot of laws, you you've got six or eight laws. You put a law on every actor in the scene. Don't forget about the boom just because you've got the actors covered with the laws. I've I've definitely had and and it's I know it's tricky because I know it's a it, it's a battle for production sound mixers. You've got the camera operator not giving you good information about, you know, where the, where the screen is and saying you've got to be wider. And so it's easier just to sort of pull back. Uh, and there's, there's time pressures. There's a lot of pressures I know, but, but the love is more often than not, it's the track that we want to use if we can, because it just sounds better. Um, you know, uh, it's got more of the natural room flair. It's got, you know, it's got a perspective of the actor that's going to more closely match what we're seeing. Um, you know, so I've definitely had some recordists that will be like, you know, we've got it covered on the lav, so we're just going to stay way far back with the boom um, because that we're not, we're not, we're not kind of getting close to the edge of the shot. We're not going to make us lose a take because we're too close to the edge of frame. Uh, you know, so. The, number one is the boom is really important and, and don't, you know, don't downplay um, the importance of that. If you, if you got a lot of loves uh, Two, the other thing is, you know, and I, this, I think for me happens more often on TV shows than film where the, the schedule is a lot tighter. If one of the loves gets messed up during a shot, you know, the actor hits it and it's come loose and it's scraping and rubbing get in there and fix it. <laughs> you know, I've, I've definitely had cases where it was screwed up on the first take and then just stayed that way for four or five or six takes, you know, probably because there was no time, but 
you know, if the if the recording's no good, then we're gonna have to do ADR, and and uh, you know, then that's you know, yeah. I, I think there's sure. a uh, issue with my audio. There we go. That's always easier said than done. I think. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. I, that's why I, all of this is a caveat that, with the caveat that I understand that there's a lot of politics on set, and you can't always do. But but when you can, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, um, you know, that, that's definitely a big one. I mean, it's, I, I know that the, the recorder's job is really tough in terms of being able to control noise and controlling, uh, squeaky floors and footsteps and refrigerators and lights and stuff, you know, as much of that as he can do. That being said, um, these days, you know, with what I was showing you with isotope and with plugins, it's a lot easier for us to get rid of noise than it used to be. Um, you know, so I feel like a lot of times my, my, you know, broadband noise is, is still a big problem, but like if there's like a very pitched noise, like an HMI whine or a, a, a very precisely pitched uh, camera whine, I can get rid of that without any, without any issues whatsoever. Um, so what kind of audio do you have a hard time getting rid of? You know, uh, I mean, it's less and less. Uh, the, 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 the big thing is really when the actors are talking quietly uh, and there's a broadband noise that's, you know, very close to the same, you know, level as the actors. At that point, there's not, there's not much that we can do to save it, you know. Um, that's, you know, definitely when, when you get the actors that really kind of get into it, whisper mode and they're getting really natural you know which is great if it's it's a great performance and it's a quiet environment so you can still get a really good recording um that's great but when they when they're getting really quiet and there's a ton of background noise there's there's nothing we can do at that point you know Hmm. Uh, and i know the actors are the actors you don't can't control how much they you know but if that's what they're going to want to do then saying, you know, if that's what we're going to do, we, we need to control these noise sources for a moment, you know, then, you know, I think that's where it sort of becomes perform, uh, important. And that, those ones also, when the actors get very quiet and subtle, it's the ones the where when we have to bring them in to, to loop those lines to do ADR for them, that they get really angry because they're like, you know, that's a really intimate, delicate performance. I can't recreate that, you know, and, and, and often they're right on the ADR stage. It doesn't have that same kind of sort of quiet intimacy that they, you know, that they were getting on their location. So those, those are the ones I feel like it's funny. Like I I've had, I've had films where I've got uh, a scene, it's a car chase. The actors are in the car and they're they're yelling back and forth to each other, and there's all kinds of like driving noise and stuff. And the recordings are fine. I'm like, you know, <laughs> they they are. I can use it. It's perfect, you know, because they're really projecting, and we got a good recording of it, and it's great. And then we go to a scene. They're uh, in the main actor's living room, and they're having a quiet, intimate conversation, and I can't use it. <laughs> <laughs> because there's a bunch of sort of just you know air noise in the location maybe it was actually shot on a set and there's an air conditioning system and and I can't use that but I can use them driving in the car with it when they were really dry you know so those are the in a way it's those the quiet delicate moments that are really the most important to kind of get control of the location as it were but that's always the case I feel like because the more no- more ambient noise is you know I feel like uh, um, everybody knows it and speaks up a little bit and, you know, can react to the environment. The very, very quiet noises, you know, you can hear everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Every noise that is. Well, you know, it's not so much, it's not so much though, like uh, percussive, like back, like somebody like dropping something in the background that we can, re- we can remove that. That's not a problem. Uh, it's really just if pe- if they're really talking very quietly and there's an air conditioner or very broadband noise that's almost at the same level that they're projecting at. That's when we just we can't save the re- the recording, you know. So it's it's much more about the sort of like the, those sort of broadband sounds, you know. 
All right. So, Dave, I have to tell you, um, people can hear me now, and I think uh -huh. we have a, a kind of rhythm going. With, yeah. Technically, I do running this uh -huh. thing. Um, Joe, I definitely miss you uh, running this thing, but we're trying to do it solo. Um, but anyways, I have questions from the Internet. Um, oh, great. What does Dave like to see in metadata? Um, how tracks are arranged dealing with plant mics or actors in acoustic space? All right. These are multiple questions. So first off, what do you like to see in metadata? Um, sorry. Someone's calling me. I'm just going to hang up. <laughs> Probably my post supervisor. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a really good question. You know, uh, obviously it's, to have the actors all named, uh, you know, and whether it's Bloom or Lob, if you can put that into the metadata, that's fantastic. Um, I mean, generally, as much information as I can get in the metadata. Do you, you know, do you see day. metadata? Uh, yes, we do. Like, so, for instance, unfortunately, I had to go back to some very old projects here to pull sound. So a lot of these are before metadata even existed. But here, I don't know if you can see the Pro Tools right now, but like... Um, you can see here that Pro Tools will show at least the channel name. Um, uh, like you can see that it's Mix, Boom, Boom 2, John, Mix minus 10, and Grace. Uh, you know, so the channel names are, are the thing that we absolutely definitely get through into Pro Tools. Uh, as far as other metadata, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how much of that actually shows up. That's, you know, the, but the channel name is the really uh, important stuff. Um, so I'm assuming that you lump that into metadata, but maybe, maybe that's not part of it. What, you know? Well, I mean, I think generally we mean scene and take, um, so, okay, but yeah, and track name. And take, yeah. So uh, that that the scene and take and the channel name are the the two metadata that we we have uh, very, you know, easily viewable here in Pro Tools. So we definitely, you know, the scene and take is, yeah, central, of course. We get that, and then we get the channel name here in the parentheses. And as much information as we can get, you know, like uh, if it's a plant, it's great to know that. If it's a boom, if it's a lob on a particular actor. I mean, usually what I'm used to is that instead of saying, like, La, you know, if it's an actor name or character name, I should say, uh, then we know that's going to be a lav. Uh, but, like, for instance, when there's boom one and boom two, like I have here, uh, if you can put that, you know, like sometimes the boom one is just for a particular actor and boom two. I get, though, a lot of times you just need to name it for the scene and not spend a lot of time during the, during the scene renaming your channels, you know, so... Um, so th this is fine, you know, when we get it, get it like this, uh, but and, yeah, as much information as the channel names as possible. And do notes come in through Pro Tools? So no, uh, we don't get notes, uh, in, in this session. I mean, there are places where we can go to get the, that metadata if we absolutely had to, but honestly, we'll see it in the sound report, um, before we'd ever go see it in the metadata as far as the notes are concerned. Good. Okay. And, but as long as you see them, that's the most yeah. important. Um, yeah, all right. So we have, um, a couple more questions from the internet. Um, dealing with, uh, plant mics. Um, I have a question about dealing with plant mics and I think this is what Ken is, um, is asking. How do you know what, what a plant mic is good for? Uh, if, if you're dealing with the ISO tracks, um, you know, cause sometimes I'll use it to goose something up, um, in the mix, but not, I don't want it used anywhere else. Does that yeah. even matter to you? Not, not really. Uh, <laughs> but it's usually pretty apparent like here, like this boom two mic, if you're, if you were, can see the pro tool screen, I mean, I don't even know what this is, but I could tell you. I don't want any of it through any of this section. If there's any spot that I'm going to want it, it's here where I can see the waveform, you know, spikes up. Because whatever it is that's on this track, I'm going to just... I don't want it there either. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes, yeah. Uh, I don't happen to have a really good example for that. But usually with the plant mic, you can just, you can tell immediately just by looking at the waveform you know, where the, we're not using it here at all sections are and where, okay, this is a section I need to check because the waveform will show, okay, someone's gotten a lot closer to this mic. 
let me see if it's if it's useful uh, in this area, you know. So when we're going through and editing, you know, we'll, we'll go through very quickly. And, you know, I mean, a lot of times the waveforms immediately tell you, okay, you know, this that's this is where this actor is talking. And, you know, this actor was a lot quieter here, but this is where they're talking. And then, you know, and it's the same thing with the plant mic. I don't happen to have, I don't think, a plant mic in any of these um, clips that I have here. So I can't show you that. But, but you know, it's it's usually pretty apparent why the plant mic is there and what we what we need it for. So understood and um ken's uh last question and this one is really dear to me um it's mics in uh helmets or other tight acoustic spaces um to what extent can you correct um that kind of sound if it's not well, appropriate or if it's overwhelming um I mean, there's nothing you can do about early reflections. Early reflections are built into the sound, and you can't do anything about them. Um, so, I mean, it, it, like, for instance, if you're talking about, like, a like a motorcycle helmet and putting a microphone in there, it's unlikely we'll be able to use it, unless that's the sound we want. Like, if it's, if it's say, we're doing an astronaut scene or a jet fighter, you know, where they're talking through the mask, and it's, you know, then then that's fantastic. I You know, I'd love to have the microphone in there because it gives that authentic sound of in that space, and there is no other way to recreate that than, than having the microphone in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love it. You know, oh, this is another, this is a pet peeve of mine. Um, when there's a prop microphone that someone's talking into and the sound recordist doesn't, connect it and record it. <laughs> you know so like if it, you know if there's a prop microphone i want that source from that microphone because it will have actually the handling which is great you know like like say you're doing a, a project where someone's a dj and they're talking supposed to be talking to the pa and they're holding this prop microphone i want to get that handling and put some of it through a pa effect and have it thump and, and crump. I'm not going to use a lot of it, but it gives this sense of naturalness, you know? And it's the same thing with, like, helmets and, 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 and plant mic. If it's the sound that you would expect to hear in that environment, like, um, you know, then then it creates this naturalness that there is no other way to create it. Uh, if it's not, if you want to, if you're trying to put it in there and but record it without having that sound, uh, you know, then there, there's nothing we can do later to take that those early reflections out. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's interesting. I used to be really like if there was a scene with a PA system, um, I would uh, try and keep the PA system almost off um, to get it to get the sound clean for you to add it. Um, but talking to more experienced sound mixers um, taught me that it's got to be a balance between getting the crowd to react and getting the, um, you know, the actor to react and that yeah. dirtying it up for that reason is sometimes not always a bad thing. Definitely not. You know, I mean, I, I always feel like the performance ultimately is the most important thing. I mean, this, this doesn't, uh, here, I'll give you an example. It has absolutely nothing to do with film. Uh, it's more of a music thing, but you know, um, a lot of, a lot of, you know, uh, vocalists when they record, uh, music, they're they're wearing headphones the same as you, right? Uh, because they want to they want to record their vocal and not have any any bleed. Well, Peter Gabriel, when he records, he doesn't like headphones. He doesn't wear headphones, and he just has speakers playing the music back uh, and a microphone. They do it. They do a little trick where they'll they'll have a stereo set of speakers out of phase so that they should cancel out at the microphone. But it's not perfect. They'll, they'll get a fair amount of bleed. Uh, but it helps him get a better performance, you know, and once you mix the track, the little bit of bleed they've got, who cares? It disappears into the track. It doesn't matter. Uh, and I, and I always feel like when it comes to sort of performance, uh, you know, our, our, our job, you know, to sort of sum it up into sort of like the very bare bones of it is to get the highest technical quality we can without interfering or damaging with the performance you know and at the point where you start to push the technical quality to a level where it's interfering with 
the the ability to get the performance, that doesn't do any good for anybody, you know. So like uh, to what you were saying, if the crowd can't react to the the guy on the PA, then you're interfering with the performance of the take. Um, and as long as you've got like a really good close mic of that guy, and then there's sound coming from the PA as well, I can use that close mic and probably not even pick up the PA sound and recreate the PA myself anyway. But it gets that crowd, you know, interacting and it gets a better performance for everybody, you know. So, I mean, that's always sort of this, the, the, the juggle, that, you know, that's, that's part of it. But uh, my feeling is, you know, you definitely don't want the quest um, for technical quality uh, to, to interfere. And ju- on a related note, I mean, it used to be a thing, and, I, and I, I think for a lot of people it still is. You know, we're, like, we're always using plugins like that one I was showing you to remove noise. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you can overdo those quite a bit, and you can end up with tracks that are so sterile that they kind of feel lifeless. Uh, and it's, and it's, 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 there's been phases in this industry, I think, with the, the post people and with mixing where, where they've taken the tracks – and they've, they've processed them so much to remove noise that they end up with something that's just not as interesting or as exciting as it was before they started, you know? And it, it's, that, it's the same thing, you know, in, in relation, that it, it, it's that quest for sort of increasing the quality, you know? You, you have to temper that with, like, at what point am I in- increasing the quality, but I've stopped paying attention to the 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 performance to to the piece to the impact of it and and you know so maybe i've got a very clean clear sound but we no longer get the same emotional feeling from it you know so and i feel like there's a lot of that in live in live recording where you and and obviously you you know it's gut instincts it's it's you know there are no right or wrong answers to those sorts of things but uh but i definitely feel like that's an important thing to always think about like um, you know, um, uh, I think I was telling you an example the other, yesterday when mm-hmm. we were chatting, uh, that, you know, back in the days before we had like really handy little like zoom recorders like this, um, <laughs> that you could just walk around and record anything. Um, uh, you know, if you wanted to go out and record some sound effects, you had to take a big lot of gear that drew attention to yourself and it made it very difficult, like, Maybe I wanted to get uh, an ambience in a library, you know, and I just needed that sort of quiet shuffling and paper and people like walking. You know, if I go into a library with a Nagra and a boom pole and a microphone, I don't even make it through the front door. They say, what are you doing? Yeah, you're not allowed to bring that in here, you know. (laughs) Right, right, right. Uh, You know, but back in the day, uh, instead, you, you couldn't take all that stuff, but you could take a little cassette recorder. And you'd go in and you'd record it on your crappy little cassette recorder and you wouldn't have very good quality, but you'd have the right sound, you know? And I feel like um, whatever enables you to get the right sound is often much more important than getting the highest quality sound. Obviously, you want to get the highest quality you can, but only up until the point where that getting that high of a quality level is interfering with you to be able to get the right sound if that makes any sense absolutely um there's a a bunch of uh good questions on facebook uh, and and they're i'm going to put them um i'm going to put them in a general category of um what do we do as sound mixers on set that make your job more difficult. And by that, I mean, what do we do technically to the track, like roll off or gain adjustments, um, you know, to kind of goose gain up on the mix track, but that get printed to ISOs. Um, What about EQ? Should they be pre or post uh, ISO track? Um, How how can we uh, not do those things? What are those things that we do that, that make your job more difficult? Well, definitely gain adjustment during the take uh well to first there shouldn't be any eq on the iso tracks i mean roll you yeah, know roll off is fine i mean you got to do you know roll off that definitely can protect you uh but beyond that you shouldn't record any eq to the iso track uh because any eq you record is going to start creating phase issues and those can be really difficult to correct or remove later and you know 
the the simple truth of the matter is that you just you, what can sound good on headphones, you know, and this this even happens with dialogue editors that they're working on headphones. What can sound good on headphones won't necessarily sound good on theater speakers, you know. So uh, to make gain adjustments, you, EQ adjustments, you just shouldn't make them on the ISO track. I totally understand why you need to for the mix track, uh, but the EQ should be after the ISOs and before the mix. Uh, and then, as much as possible, not riding levels during a take. Now, I know sometimes suddenly someone gets suddenly loud that you weren't expecting, and of course you've got to ride the levels in those situations. But as minimal level riding as possible, and I'll give you a demonstration of why. If I, you know, like you can see if I look at. Uh, um, you know these takes uh, that I've got here up on the Avid. You can just see by looking at the waveform or on the Pro Tools um, that the the gain the the background noise is very even. And when we go to get rid of the noise, you know we'll go into a program and uh, like like Isotope here, and we can sample that noise. Um, um, like I, I can open this and I can tell this to sort of learn the noise sample and based on that level of noise it can remove uh, the sample but if you ride the level up or down during the take then I'm gonna have to go to every spot where the background level changed and resample and re you know so when I could just select this whole take get a sample and get rid of the noise if you didn't ride the level if the ISO level is ridden up or down during the recording, then what is a two-second process for me suddenly becomes a 10-minute or 15-minute process. And once you start getting into hundreds of, of cues where that's happening, that, that, that ends up being an inordinate amount of time. Uh, now, again, I understand sometimes someone surprises you and they get really quiet or really loud and you weren't expecting it. You've got to ride the levels for that. that that's cool. But it's when you're just sort of riding it constantly when there's no necessarily reason to. I'd much rather have, a, you know, a recording that dips a little bit low and then we've got to raise it up later than, than one where you're sort of riding it, uh, you know, throughout. Uh, so I have a follow-up question to that. Um, uh, there's two manufacturers that make portable 32-bit floating point recorders. Yeah. Have you gotten any 32-bit floating point tracks from set, and is that interesting for you? Huh. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, Pro Tools certainly has the ability to deal with 32-bit floating point audio at this point. I don't believe I've gotten anything yet, though, that has 32-bit audio in it. Uh, it used, I have had some jobs that have worked at 96 K <laughs> twenty four uh -huh. bit, which that's torture. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, I'm curious but, why why was that torture? Is it simply the double double data rate? You know, the data rate's not really the big thing. If if they insist that you preserve the material in ninety six K, then on all of your DSP processing, you have half as many. Like I have half as many tracks available. I have half as many plugins I can use because the computer needs twice as much DSP to handle the 96K. And frankly, um, once it goes to the theaters, it's it's not even 24-bit, you know, and it's 48K, and, uh, you know, the, you just aren't going to hear the difference, you know? So all it does is eliminate my, you know, the amount of processing power I have to, to deal with the thing. It cuts it in half. It doesn't gain any increase in quality. Um, now, 32-bit 32 32 floating. 32-bit, though, yeah. I, I don't, it's a really good question. I, don't, I haven't received any yet. I don't think, as far as Pro Tools is concerned, I think it would be relatively invisible. I mean, I've created 32-bit audio and used it in Pro Tools, and it, you know, I, 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 I can't see it being harmful I, I'm not positive if there'd be any major advantage to it um, unless you're having to really sort of radically raise the levels of stuff. Um, then then it probably would be really useful. But it's rare that I have to raise the levels of stuff that much. Yeah, I mean, I think it... it um, 
I, I think it gives production sound mixers um, a pr- more headroom. Well, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, this leads into some common um, issues that I've heard where um, sound editors uh, want either more or they want more level out of the ISOs. They say the production sound mix are under recorded, um, you know, on rare occasions, it, you know, over recorded. Um, right. But I, I think the idea that there would be, you'd really have to work so hard to screw up the levels in 32 bit floating point. Yeah, um, yeah. And so that would end that discussion. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's, it's, my only hesitancy in answering it is it's just not something I've really tried, you know, to sort of put into practice to see if something would come up in some of the software somewhere where, where it would cause an issue. To my knowledge, it wouldn't. And I, to my knowledge, it would be a great thing to do. But, but I haven't put it into practice. That's just theoretical. It yeah. would be great. Not practically. It would be great if you know the, the, <laughs> what I mean. Like, for instance... I know Pro Tools can deal deal with that kind of audio. I don't know if the Avid can deal with 32-bit floating point. Um, you know, so right. so you might already right off the bat run into an issue there. Now that being said, the Avid makes copies of everything that it imports anyway, so it doesn't use the audio as they get it, regardless. So it would probably just convert it to whatever it could use, and it wouldn't be an issue. Uh, by the way, just you know, for your recordists, if they're wondering. I don't use the audio from the Avid. We link it back to the original production audio and use the audio files that you deliver, not the audio files that went through the DIT, not the audio files that went through the Avid. You know, we go straight back to the original source um, and relink all that material, which is a bit time-consuming and painful. But uh, but I find that it it is it saved my butt on numerous occasions where there's some process between when it left you and when it got to me that somebody screwed it up. And so I just eliminate all that material between you and me <laughs> and just use that <laughs> instead, uh, just as an aside there. Uh, but I don't know. That, that's a really interesting question. I think 32-bit floating point would be certainly a great way to record. And uh, um, I can't see any downside to it, and I can see a tremendous amount of upside to it. But I... I don't think I'm not aware of anyone having delivered it to me that way. But that being said, it's possible somebody might have, and I might not have just noticed because in Pro Tools it doesn't. It, you don't. If I import something in 32 bit, it doesn't give me a warning or tell me that I imported something 32 bit. So it's possible I've had some stuff like that and not even been aware of it. In- interesting. Um, all right. Well, I, I do. I do want to sort of ask this question then um isolated tracks versus mix track um how do we resolve this as a production sound mixing team you know what should we really be monitoring um how do we split our attention yeah i mean it's 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 <laughs> it, it's a it's a tricky question i mean obviously if you just ignore the mix track entirely and you only focus on the ISO track, you're going to get a call from the picture department saying, this mix track is terrible, we can't use this. Uh, And the picture department is the one that's on at the time that you're shooting, and they're the one that's getting the material, and they're, they're the one that's dealing with the material. You won't have me there to defend you and say, no, the ISOs are great. <laughs> so, I mean, you obviously have to give a good enough mix track that the picture department is not going to be upset. Um, but then, you know, I mean, from my perspective, as long as the ISOs are, you know, well recorded, uh, and, you know, uh, and not a lot of stuff done to them, that, that's really my preference, you know? So, Mm -hmm. like, I think you could put the ISOs in and, 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 I'm not as familiar as with some of the latest and greatest with the Zaxcom and the Kantar. I know they've, they've added features left and right over the past year, so I'm not entirely up on what they can and can't do. But if you can just feed it into the ISOs, I, I don't know if you get a display that can show you levels and stuff with Absol- the ISOs. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yes. so if you're just getting decent levels and then doing all of your riding and EQing after the fact into the mix track, 
and listening to the mix track, I would think that would be okay. But but I know that there are some issues with some of the recorders where what you're getting on the mix track isn't necessarily what you have on the ISOs. So yeah, I mean, I think definitely you have to be careful. I'm going to ask you a dreaded question. Um, decent level. Um, where do you like to see the average level of average dialogue in terms of DBFS? You know, I, I'll be honest, it's not something I think about a lot. Uh, when I'm working on material, um, uh, you know, it, it depends tremendously on what the actor is doing. If they're whispering or, or talking very quietly, I, I'm not looking for a very high level. Like, I, I don't want... Uh, a really loud recording of someone talking quietly uh, because uh, unless you, you need to get that just to be able to get any recording at all uh, but um, you know and if someone's yelling of course you know it, sh it should be you know up there you know as close to the top as it could I, I kind of feel like um, you know when we're mixing for instance a lot of times you know, the dialogue uh, is peaking at minus 12, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, and, and that's, you know, that's for normal conversation, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like, if, if you were set up so you're, you're peaking minus 10, minus 12 for normal conversation, and if you find I, maybe that's getting you too loud when you've got actors that have like a tremendous amount of dynamic range and they're getting really loud, uh, you know, you need to record lower. That That is totally fine by me. But, you know, it's that's one of those territories. It's like uh, mouse or trackball. Everyone's got their own opinion on it. And, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and depending on who your mix, re-recording mixer and who your post-supervising sound editor is, uh, they're going to have different opinions on that. But I feel like if you record naturally to the performance the actors are giving, um, it's certainly going to be a recording that people are going to be able to take and use and, and get, uh, you know, good results out of. Um, and at the end of the day, that's the most important thing, that somebody can take your material and turn it into something really good if they can take your material and they can't that's a problem you know <laughs> so uh can is it reasonable for a production sound mixer to um engage in a dialogue with a supervising sound editor maybe even one that's not on their film and sort of say hey i have some questions can i play you a track i recorded absolutely uh you know i i was doing a job um it was like two years ago uh, it was a TV show uh, that I did for Cinemax called Warrior. And uh, they built the sets and they shoot it, shot it in South Africa and they built the sets. And, you know, the, the, the project was set to take place in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So, of course, they built sets that are rickety old wood uh, sets. And uh, they got on the sets to start shooting and every floorboard squeaked and every time there were like three or four people walking it sounded like a herd of elements and the production <laughs> sound recordist got in touch with me he's like oh my god what am i gonna do let me send you some of this stuff like this is this is a problem you know and it was a problem i mean it was a um you know but the the good thing is he flagged it immediately and 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 they were able to say okay let's treat these floors a little bit you know, we're going to be shooting these locations a bunch. Let's treat these floors. And they were able to minimize it to a point that we could, you know, fix the, the rest of it, you know. Uh, and those kind of conversations, I think, are hugely important because, you know, I, I think a lot of times, um, you, you know, it's, it's funny because I've dealt sometimes where um, I deal, you know, with... Um, um, line producers or uh, or per film producers and they'll say oh yeah uh, they should hire this sound guy he's he's the best he never once complained or or held us up because he was trying to get better sound and and I'm like no 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 <laughs> that's not the sound guy you want you want the sound guy that at least occasionally <laughs> is like hey we need to get better sound you know and and 
the, I think the thing that happens with with production sound recordists is sometimes when you're raising a red flag, you need somebody else in your corner that can say, no, this is really an issue and it's going to cost you money later on if you don't deal with it. And so by reaching out to a supervising sound editor, you've got somebody that can be in your corner and defend you and say, hey, yeah, if you don't deal with this, then we're going to have to loop all this stuff and it's going to cost you, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, depending on, on what we're talking about. Now, sometimes it's only three or four lines and like, oh, that's way cheaper than the extra hour it's going to cost us, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but sometimes it's hundreds of lines and they'll be like, oh, actually, it'd be cheaper for us to just solve this now and not loop all that stuff, you know. So I think having that dialogue sometimes is definitely it's useful to get other people on in your corner to help fight. Absolutely. I've had um, successful conversations like that with regards to, say, set construction, um, you know, making the set sound better or uh, more usable for dialogue um, in terms of uh, floors or, or acoustics um, where yeah. you can bring in the sound editor and and hopefully the post-production producer and they can just give a number. So, yeah, yeah. it's this much yeah. to fix it now or this much to fix it later. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I definitely uh, related to that. Had seen, had issues where you know they're shooting in the sound stage. The whole film's going to take place in a tiny little room, and they build this set in a sound stage, and it's a huge sound stage, and they've got no, no dampening at all. And so there's this long reverb on the on the recordings that there's nothing the sound recorders can do about it on the day. And I'm like, if this is your whole film. We have to throw it all out and loop the entire film from beginning to end because you've got this giant reverb on this little tiny space that the actors are. I, I yeah, I had to do that um, for an ex. They built an exterior scene inside, and yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like, "There's no way this sounds like it's outside." No, no, you cannot remove an early reflection from something. I mean, it just is not possible. So yeah, that that's always the the biggest thing, you know. If something's supposed to be outside, it either needs to be outside or it needs to be really dead with no uh, early reflections. Because forget it. Once that's in there, it's going to sound like it's interior and nothing, no one's ever going to be able to change that. Yeah. I'm going to um, try and sum up a bunch of questions that I'm getting off the Internet. Okay, um, cool. But it's, um, you know. One thing I'll say is when I'm making a production mix, no matter how many microphones out there, I'm trying to make it sound like it was one microphone for the whole scene. Um, yeah. Do you do the same thing as you're do, going through the isolated tracks and piecing it together? You want it to sound like one quote unquote mic? Not, not during the editing part of it, but during the mix. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once when I'm mixing stuff, uh, I'll start, I'll do a pass of a given scene with the, with the boom mic you know, because that's usually what I sort of judge as to sort of how things actually sound, uh, you know, and obviously sometimes the boom doesn't sound good for whatever reason or not, but I'll go through and then I'll go to the lobs and, and match them as best I can to the boom. So I could, I could switch back and forth between the boom and the lob, uh, and it should, you know, as close as I can, you know, I should be able to go back and forth between them and not have you be like oh that's a different mic you know so absolutely try and get it to sound like it's all just from beginning to the end of the film you know unless there's places where you know like i said someone talking into a prop mic or something that you wanted to sound do you um this is a loaded question how important is the boom i mean it, for me i could if the boom is good i don't need the lock uh, if the lobs are good, I'm still going to use the boom unless it's just unusable. Uh, you know, so like to me, the boom is the best mic. Everyone, again, though, that that's a matter of taste item as well. I mean, you'll definitely find uh, some supervisors and some mixers that uh, that are going to want to feature the lobs over the boom. That they like that sort of more intimate in your face kind of, you know, I, I, I usually aim for naturalness and I like things to, you know, have a sort of a more natural feel to them. Uh, and the boom to my ear has a more natural character to it, you know? Uh, but you, you'll get some scenes where, 
there's because of noise issues or whatever, the boom is unusable, and then uh, I've got to use the lot. But even in those scenes, I still like to have the boom because I can still listen to it and kind of hear in my mind's eye, at least, what it would have sounded like had there not been that noise or whatever made the, the boom unusable. Uh, and so it's useful to have that, you know, to, to temper how you then treat the loss to sound as close to what it, you would have gotten from the boom had you been able to use it, if, if that makes sense. Um, this question from Sean Allen, uh, how much uh, of something bad negates the boom? In other words, how much work should the sound mixer do um, to make the boom work for you to be able to use it? I mean, I, as much as possible. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure really how to answer that. I mean, it, it, you know, everything in this, in this business is a case-by-case -case scenario, and, and it's all sort of in context, you know. Um, but I... I, I you know, on any circumstance, will always, I think you should record the boom, even if you think it's just absolutely unusable. Uh, because sometimes what is absolutely unusable um, before you pop it into a plugin like Isotope or something else like that, there are things that you would think just, you know, I mean, I, I worked on a show once that uh, it, it had the unfortunate situation of... Um, they went into production just as the 17 year of cicadas, you know, came out. And the entire thing was just like, shh, of these cicada sounds, you know, and they, you know, what can you do? Like, you, it's the cicadas, you, they're shooting outside, there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, and the, uh, the idea was that that stuff was totally unusable. And this was I, probably 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and at that time, there was a lot less uh, equipment for uh, dealing with those sorts of problems. But we were able to solve it on a, I'd say, like 80% of the film. Now, I, I wouldn't even think twice about it. I'd be like, yeah, I, I can remove all of that. It's not really that much of an issue, you know. But if your thought, if your mindset is, oh, well, I've got all this in the boom, I, ca I can't even use this, I'm not going to record it. You just never know what somebody else can solve uh, in post. Like I, I can get rid of distortion now. I can, which that was never even an option before. Uh, even pretty severe distortion, I've successfully gotten rid of. I, I've had cases where there was a crow cawing right on an actor's line, and I was able to get rid of the crow and keep the line. You know, like this. There's, there's really some kind of amazing things you can do. Um, so my feeling is get it as good as you can, but then just go ahead and record it. You know, if it's not usable, we won't use it. But you know, sometimes you might think it's not usable, and it absolutely. So I have a I have a confession to make about uh, a scene. Let's say where uh, I know I have to use the wires. Um, because of certain coverage issues or I can't get the boom close enough. Um, there'll be a time where sometimes I'll ask the boom operator to come up a little bit so I don't phase on between the boom and the wires on the mix track. Should I not be doing that? Should I um, drop the boom more so that my mix track doesn't phase? Should I not care about the phasing knowing that you, somebody in your hands can, um, can fix it? I mean, I, I would definitely not do anything to compromise the boom to, to make the mix track better. Uh, yeah, we can absolutely fix the phase. I mean, uh, I mean if that, I, instead of doing that, I would just put less of the boom into the mix track, you know, mm -hmm. just put more of the wires in. And it's, uh, it's usually when I want more room. I want to make the wire sound roomier, but I can't do it if the boom is right on top of the wire. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. In that case, I, I, I don't think I. I'll tell you what. You go to a fair a number of uh, picture edit rooms, and they're usually relatively reverby, and this, they're they're listening to speakers that more often than not they actually have set up behind the picture <laughs> monitor because they don't really care that much about the sound. I don't think you're going to get a lot of picture editors complaining that like, geez, I wanted more reverb on that mix track. <laughs> right. You know, so I, I I would say never ever compromise the quality of the boom mic uh, to get a better mix track. Fair, uh, uh, fair, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, I am running out of questions on the internet. So if anybody has any other questions, 
Um, I think we've gotten to all the stuff that I wanted to get to. Um, I do, you know, we talked a lot of uh, tech stuff. Um, you have a story that I, I got to hear at AES um, about your work on Drive. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I wonder if you remember the story you told about how you, this is, we're now switching gears into sound design and storytelling. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. the story that you told about how, uh, driver's world was reflected, uh, in the sound of the car and drive. I really do love that story. Oh, well, Hmm. I'm not sure I remember the, the specific story, but I remember certainly a lot about how we created Driver's World in that, that movie, you know, like, um, uh, you know, the, I'm not sure this is the one that you're after, but this was what I found to be the most fascinating uh, aspect of, of the sound that we did for that movie, which was the director had this idea... Uh, and I, I have no idea if this is a story that you're after or not. So <laughs> I'll, I'll prompt you. Not, Don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> if it's not the one you're interested in, uh, tell me. <laughs> but the director had this idea that you only heard what you saw on camera. There was there was no world outside of the camera frame, um, which is 180 degrees opposite of what most directors are asking for. They usually say, create this world that's outside the frame you know, so that it puts what we're seeing into context of the world. And his his approach was the exact opposite. He said, if, you know, if we somebody's walking across the frame and we, we're hearing their footsteps, the moment they get out of frame, I don't hear their footsteps anymore. Their foot, they're gone. We don't hear them. They're just, they don't exist anymore. And which was kind of alien to me. I was like, wow, that, that's not what we do, you know. And, and But we're like, all right, this is what you want to do. This is what we're going to do. And we started, we started doing it. And the fascinating thing was it gave it gave this real intimacy to what was happening on camera. It kept the focus on exactly the frame, and there was nothing else that would distract you. Uh, and it gave this really kind of immediacy to everything. Uh, the more that we did it, and then we started to really get into it, and we're like, "This is great," you know, <laughs> like this is, you know, uh, and and it was fascinating how sort of creating this set of rules. Uh, that was different from in the rules that you normally use created this really vibrant, interesting quality. I don't know if that's the one that you were after, though. Well, I mean, I, I didn't, I never heard that, and that's fascinating, and that makes a lot of sense now thinking about the movie. Um, the story I remember you telling was that the director uh, doesn't even have a driver's license or didn't oh, have a driver's license. No, he doesn't know anything about driving a vehicle at all. Actually. And, oh, okay, I know what you're <laughs> after then. Okay, so you know, the during the during the chase sequence he wanted this this uh you know this this these you know escalation on shots and, and, and ramping up and, and of of speed and intensity. So all of these cars were automatic transmission uh, vehicles. Uh, but we were putting in gear shift, you know, like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> that you would get from using a manual transmission and changing gears. And it had absolutely nothing to do with the reality of those sequences. You know, they were automatic transitions, transmissions. The engine would be like, you know, it would be very smooth transitions. But it wouldn't give you that sort of excitement, you know. So during the car chase section, uh, there was a tremendous amount of, of each cutting, you know, to each vehicle having changes in, in pitch. And then within longer shots, having the pitch suddenly change on the engine to indicate sort of a speed up or a slow down uh, that just gave this sort of excitement and energy. And uh, but he knew nothing about it. When we'd say, well, that doesn't happen, he'd be like, I don't care. <laughs> you, know, like, I, you know, I've never driven. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is, does it make it more exciting for me or does it not make it more exciting? And was there something that he had you do or that you came up with where when Driver's World was crashing in on him, you started to add different sounds or change the sound of the engine? Well, we, we added a lot of material to the engine that was not engine related. Mm -hmm. I mean, this whole thing of sort of grinding stone and stuff that's mixed with it at certain places. Uh, I think that the thing that I found kind of the most interesting was, um, you know, we do some stuff 
where it, you know, especially in the scene in the beginning where he was sort of, you know, they were trying to avoid the police and, you know, drive down under the bridge, you know, we'd do some stuff where we'd roll all the high end out of the, out of the, uh, the sound of the engine and give it this sort of underwater kind of feel. Uh, like almost like he, you know, like if we were in his perspective, like he literally dived underwater and the engine would do the, you know, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it would give this, this, this stealth kind of quality to it that again, had nothing to do with reality of how stuff would actually be, but it gave this, this sense of sneaking and hiding and, you know, and so you, you know, so like. They'd be they'd be sort of in run mode, like and the engine's really up, and then when they're trying to like sort of back slow down and hide and be you know invisible and and you know just using EQ uh, to 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 make those switches. Uh, but there were definitely other you know sound design elements um, that were added in with the engine as well uh, during different sections to give you know different character to. To what's happening yeah i um yeah i mean i i i'm a huge fan of using sound to tell the story not just you know production sound obviously um i remember you talking about using rocks rocks in a pail yeah uh, yeah which instead of an engine which i thought was awesome yeah yeah i I'll be honest, it was a long time ago. I know, I'm sorry. I should have. <laughs> it just always st- stuck with yeah. me. Um, all right, we have great, great questions uh, on the internet now. Um, so uh, one is about room tone. Um, you know, how important is, is room tone, and is there a way you prefer to get it? I'll tell you what, room tone isn't nearly as important as it used to be. Do, do they still see my Pro Tools up? Um, uh, they, they do now. Okay, like, let me give you an example here. Uh, if say I've got this piece. Hell not. All right, there's this little spot in here. I can I can select this uh, and I can send this as a reference to Isotope, and then I can select this whole area and I can go into Isotope and I can take this little reference spot. Uh, I can select this. I don't know how long this is. This is maybe uh, not a tenth of a second. This is an extreme example, but um, I can uh, bring this thing up to learn the ambience, and then I can select this whole area and tell it to write that ambience for the whole area, and then I'll send it back to Pro Tools. And this is all... But I got from a tenth of a second, uh, you know. Now, if I get two or three seconds, I get a better quality room tone. But so getting room tone recordings, not not hugely important anymore. Uh, I mean, that being said, if there is a huge difference to me for room tone versus ambience. Like, for instance, if you're outside on the street and there's, like, interesting birds and there's, you know, people chattering then those kind of recordings are fantastic because they have movement and dynamics in them and things happen. And like, if you can get some of that material, some environmental sort of stuff, uh, but just straight room tone, just stuff. I I would say we don't need it at all. Um, yeah. And, and that goes to also Ken's point of like getting wild tracks of vintage cars and stuff that you would have a hard time getting. Anytime you can, absolutely, please. Uh, it's so great to get those recordings, and sometimes it's so difficult to get get that stuff again after the production is over to record it if it if it wasn't recorded. So, like for instance, if you got a vintage car and they're getting in and out of it a bunch, if you can get me a wild track of the door open and close, especially if it's got a really good scronk or, you know, like, uh, and do know, different rattly. perspectives help or you just get as close as possible? Uh, you know, all I will say is it's easier for us to take something that's recorded close and make it sound like it's distant. Uh, you know, so if you get a close recording, that's great. If all you get is a wide recording, what I need is a close recording, there's nothing I can do with that. If you get me a close recording and I need a wide recording, I can turn the close recording into a wide recording. 
So uh, if you can get different perspectives, if you've got that kind of time, that wonderful. Uh, but but if you can't, always just get the close recording. Yeah. Um, all right. And thank you. I have, uh, let's see, Antonio and Michael are, are asking similar questions. Uh, Antonio, some actors insist on putting uh, laws on themselves and aren't good at it or have, are soft talkers with chest hair. How much can you clean that stuff up? And then Michael's question, um, would you rather get a close lav, um that, uh, you know, has uh, less background noise, but um, over a lower place lav that's more natural? Oh, well, that's a really good question. Uh, the first question, I, I don't know. I mean, especially in this area era of Me Too, I, it's it's very difficult, you know, sort of insisting that you put the, the mic on the actor. I can kind of get why, you know, that can be, you know, complicated territory. Uh, but, you know, uh, that being said, I mean, if you if you tell the actor, look, you didn't do it right and let me at least demonstrate to you and and if they're like i don't want to hear it then you say okay how much do you like adr because you're going to do a ton of it <laughs> because your mic's not on you know like i mean i think letting them know that they're they're creating an issue that they're gonna have to solve after the fact some actors despise adr and if you throw that at them, I bet they'll be like, okay, yeah, fix the mic, fix the mic. <laughs> one, one, uh, thing, one trick I found with, in those situations is often those actors have a close circle of wardrobe people around them and uh, yeah. hair and makeup and yeah. all give context to their wardrobe person. Cause I can't run on set and start changing yeah. stuff, but yeah, yeah. their wardrobe person knows how to do that, you know, knows how right. to run up to them and make a quick change. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's, a, I don't, I don't really know, you know, obviously how to solve that, but it, it certainly, you know, uh, yeah, it's certainly an issue. And I've definitely had cases where I've had one actor in a film that was just always terribly recorded, uh, and we just weren't able to use their love. And it was for exactly that reason, because they insisted on putting it on themselves and wouldn't let the sound recorders get near them. And they didn't know what they were doing, and it was like, okay, well, this is just unusable, you know. <laughs> so, and you'd have you'd have a scene where you've got three actors recorded really well, and it's totally usable. And one actor that you just can't use the material for at all, and you're just like, all right, well, we're just going to do a ton of ADR with this person, or we've got a really good boom, and we're going to use the boom for that person, mm -hmm. you know? and uh, which is another reason why the boom becomes so important, you know. And to Michael's question of, do you compromise the sound quality of the lav based on background noise? In yeah. other words, I can put a lav right around somebody's neck and that, yeah. you know, might get rid of some background noise, but it's not going to sound good. It's not going to sound yeah. natural. I, I, I'd be honest. I mean, again, it depends. The context is always such an important thing to these questions. But, but my, my gut would be, don't compromise it. You know, I mean... Even just from a lav, you know, if there's that much back background noise, more than likely the actor is going to be projecting a bit more anyway. Um, and if there's that much background noise, you know, usually it's something that that you, it's something that you see in the shot that we're not going to be surprised to hear a little bit of the background noise. So I'd still always much rather have a a a. a natural sounding recording uh and like i said a lot of times you can as long as as long as the voice is um as long as the voice is you know relative to the noise um <laughs> is good no way for that Oh, we lost, we lost, uh, we lost Dave. Hang on one second. Let's see what we could do here. Oh no. Dave's, Dave's by phone. Hey Dave. Your power, oh, here, I'm just going to put you uh, on speaker. Your power went out. Yeah, 
Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> like I was saying, we were having thunderstorms and high winds up here earlier, but uh, I guess that it's still, it came back on. I can try and connect with you again in a, in a moment uh, once my computer fires back up, but... Uh, or, uh, uh, oh no, that's too bad. Um, yeah, let's let's try it. Okay. Uh, it, it'll just be a minute or two till uh, uh, it gets rebooted. Uh. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. What do we have going on? Um, now I'm completely blind. So let's see what we have going on on live stream. Um, but, you know, I think, Dave, let's, um, <laughs> let's take this as a sign. Um, and uh, why don't we sign off? Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for... Um, for for being with us so you had some thunderstorms you were having thunderstorms up there yeah yeah <laughs> so, and it's crazy high wind the wind has been blowing like nobody's business today so uh uh yeah it's actually not storming right now but i guess the the wind has blown some branches or something so uh amazing all right well stay safe please and um everybody out there stay safe um this seems like a good uh opportunity to end it we, we ended up speaking for almost an hour and a half thank you everybody for watching i hope everybody's safe dave thank you for for being a part of this crazy thing um My joe I joe i miss you time. all right good dave thank you so much and it's it's really great to see everybody and talk to you and and uh we'll see you soon